Continuing where we left off last class period, we talked about Bernoulli's principle and the Bernoulli equation. And I stopped here. Didn't have much time to go over it. So let's talk about very quickly, very quickly, not that quickly, how an airplane flies and how a sailboat works. So you have an airplane traveling through the air. Let's just make up a number and say that the airplane is traveling at um, 200 meters per second. That's roughly two thirds the speed of sound. So speed is equal to 200 meters per second. Then you have the wing that splits the air and the air has to go a longer distance over the top of the wing than the bottom of the wing. Remember, what was the purpose of having to go a larger distance over the top than the bottom? Are they like giving away oranges or tangerines upstairs? <laughs> I, I just realized everyone's eating them. Okay, what's the purpose of having a longer distance on the top of the wing than on the bottom? Okay. All I heard from Mira was to keep it from crashing, which no, I, I love. But that's why it's blunt. Oh, okay. It's blunt for that reason. And then it's curved so you have a larger distance on the top, so you will have a lower pressure on the top. How do they achieve a lower pressure? You have higher distance the air has to travel over the top, hence you have a higher speed. So this will be the speed of the air is 200 meters per second. If my wing is shaped so that the distance, okay, go, let me just change the color. The distance going from here to here is length times 1.20, that is 20% longer than the length on the bottom. then it's going to have a speed on the top that is, of course, 20% longer distance, hence 20% higher speed. So I'll have the speed top is equal to the air speed times that same 1.20. So it has higher air speed. Now, I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Don't distract her. Okay, Leslie. Still missing Clayton and James, right? Yeah. So the wind is going faster over the top, and so we can calculate the pressure difference between the top and bottom using the Bernoulli relation. That is pressure top plus one-half density of the air times the speed of the top squared plus rho g to the top is equal to the pressure of the bottom half I should put air there too v the bottom squared plus rho air g a to the bottom the difference in height from the top to bottom of the wing is negligible so we're just going to say that height bottom is equal to height top so I can subtract those out of my equation. Got to use the finger. Subtract those out immediately. And then I just resolve that for pressure bottom minus pressure top equals one half density of air times. And notice bottom is the positive, top is the negative for the pressure. So the top is going to be the positive. It's going to stay on that side v top squared minus v bottom squared. So that's the pressure difference between the top and bottom. How is that going to translate into the lift of the airplane? Simply net force is equal to the pressure times area at the bottom minus pressure times area at the top. So the force lift, the net force due to air,
equals area times this thing above. I ran out of space. So area times one half density of the air times the speed of the top squared by speed of the bottom squared. Now, of course, speed of the top is just 1.2 speed of the bottom in my problem. So speed of top squared would be 1.44 speed of bottom squared. And so I can make it 1.44. For So this last equation is very specific to this problem and not general in any way. where A is the area of the wing. So the bigger the area of the wing, the more lift you'll have. Of course, we tend to think we want more lift on airplanes. And when we're taking off, we do. Because you want to be able to take off at a relatively slow speed. But when you're up and cruising, you don't want to have too much lift, otherwise the airplane just keeps rising. So what do they do with an airplane to adjust the lift? They, they actually extend the wing. So during takeoff and landing, you'll see them extend the wing, making it longer, which is increasing the area, thus increasing the lift for the same <laughs> airspeed. So they can slow down. Because when you land an airplane, I don't know how to fly, by the way. I'm just talking physics here, not talking practicality. What I understand you want to do is you want to get down there within three feet of the ground and then reach stall speed. Stall speed is when you slow down enough that the lift force is smaller than the force of gravity and you fall out of the air. But if you're within three feet of the ground when you reach stall speed, well, you just hit the ground and you have a nice smooth landing. So they put out those flaps so they can slow down and have a lower stall speed and then stop more quickly. And likewise, when you're taking off, you want to be able to get up in the air sooner so you don't have to use you know, nine miles of runway. Now I have a second picture here that is of a, a sailboat. And I just have to point this out. You guys are probably thinking, if I don't understand this, maybe I, well, you're probably not thinking this, but somebody's thinking, if I don't understand this, I must be an idiot. Well, I want you to know that it's not true. I, when I was in graduate school, now this guy, I would consider him an idiot. We all did. There was a guy named Cleon. Uh, he, he would tell you his name was Clem, but you know, we're going to call him, we're going to call him. I won't tell you his last name just because you can go look him up. Um, Cleon, the first thing he did when he came to graduate school, he got his office and he says, hey, do you know if there's a local chapter of Mensa? Because he was a genius and you know, he wanted to hang out with his geniuses. And of course, all the regular physics majors are like, dude, hey, what? You know, anyhow, Cle Cleon's famous for a couple of things, like for his PhD research, my, my roommate who was in his research group, they would lock him out of the room and do the experiments for him because he would screw them up. <laughs> okay, Cleon also did not believe that a sailboat could ever go faster than the wind speed. Cleon believed that if you have a sailboat and the wind is 10 miles an hour, the maximum speed for the sailboat is 10 miles an hour. Well, that is not what physics says. Physics says that the sailboat is pushed by the same thing that makes an airplane stand up or stand up, fly, excuse me. Same thing that makes the airplane fly. And that is the pressure difference from one side of the wing to the other side of the wing. So this is the ugliest slide ever. I know there's a way to erase everything on here, but I am instead just gonna go to a blank slide, which is black, who cares? So here's our sailboat and we have the sail like this. And if I have wind that's blowing like this, what we get is a trapped air region 
where we have essentially still air in here. So we have, in essence, the same thing as was going on with an airplane wing. The air is passing over shorter distance on the back side of the sail, a larger distance on the front side of the sail. And so because of the difference in pressure, there's going to be a net force. What direction will the net force be pointing here? Toward the area with the higher pressure or with the higher speed. Okay, so it's going to be like this. That's the direction of the force of the sail. Now we have our first problem. How many people have done sail? Okay, a few. I, it was one of the, I don't know, 15 or 20 PE classes I took in college, sailing class. I couldn't get into the windsurfing class, so I took sail. We had cool PE classes. So what's the problem we have here with that force? What's it going to make the boat do if that's the only force acting horizontally? Okay, it's going to push it forward and sideways. So we're going to have to have something to keep the boat straight. What do we use to keep the boat straight? Okay, we have a rudder. We have a rudder back here. We also have a keel that probably is going through the center. Our boats were little 12-foot vagabonds, and they had a dagger board, just a board you shove down through the center of the boat that gives you a, a force that's going to bring it back like this. So I'll put force of the keel is bringing back to center. So the net force is forward. So you have a net force that's forward due to the combination of the keel and the wind or the sail. And what's the condition that's going to set your top speed? How fast the wind's blowing or what, how big the difference is with the sail. Okay talking about forces specifically. You're, you're, you're not thinking wrong. But the force of the sail determines how fast you go. Well, what's, if, if that was the only force, you would just accelerate forever, though. Something's slowing you down. What's slowing you down? Drag from the, Drag water. From the water. Or viscosity. So you are, which leads to viscosity, yes. So you are going to go faster and faster until the, the water's drag force is equal to the forward force you're getting from the wind. So there's a couple ways you can make a boat go faster. And the most obvious way to make a boat go faster is to lower the drag force. Well, what's going to lower the drag force? Getting the boat out of the water. So, okay. so <laughs> it, it, it actually would. Um, but yeah, we're not going to do that. We soaked the ocean. Um, so get the boat out of the water. So if you watch America's Cup races, when I was a kid, I watched anything that had to do with sports. So I watched a lot of America's Cup races. And back then they had these 12 meter boats with, you know, they're really big boats. The 12 meters is not measuring their length. In this case, it's a really complicated measurement. And they had really sophisticated keels to try to give them better fluid dynamics, reduce the lift. Nowadays, because of, uh, was it Michael Fay? I'm not sure if I got the name right. A guy from um, New Zealand or Australia kind of tried to subvert the rules of the America's Cup and challenged America right after we had won, before we had issued an invitation to a regatta. And the rules allow for a match race in that case. And he didn't specify the boat. Or no, he did specify a boat. He specified a huge boat instead of the 12-meter boats that they had traditionally sailed. And if you have a really big boat, you can have a much bigger sail. You get a lot more forward force compared to drag force, and you can go faster. And so he figured he was going to win the race because of physics. He, a bigger boat, he's going to go faster. They didn't have time to work out the aerodynamics for a big boat, the fluid dynamics. He'd been building this boat for like three years. He had a long-term plan. And so he made one mistake. He did not specify a monohull boat. And another way to decrease the drag is to make a dual hole boat. Why? With a monohull boat, you have that keel force. Of course, I only looked at it from the top, but if you look at this keel force and the wind force from a side view, 
there's your keel. The wind is pushing this way, and the keel is pushing this way. What's going to happen? Yeah, it's going to flip over. It's creating torques. So what do you have to do in that case? Well, in our sailing class, we love to hike. You get out on the side that is tipped up, and you use your body as a counterbalance. You're creating a counter torque so you can you know, withstand more wind force. And you sheet in to the point where you're tipped as much as you can without capsizing. And we love doing that so much that you know we capsized a few times. We decided it would be even better. We had three people in this little 12-foot bag on them. It was 14-foot, I don't know. We had three people, so we'd have two people hiking on the high side and one person hiking on the low side, so they're making a torque with the wind, so the other two people would have more fun on the high side. All torques, which is why I'm actually telling you this story. So you have this torque problem. And so what they do is they make the keel very, very heavy. They'll put in something like lead or spent uranium in that keel so it's very, very heavy. Why make it very, very heavy? Because then that will also supply a counter torque to keep it from tipping. But if you make a dual hole boat, you have these holes that are very separated. You just have a trampoline in between, of course, with the rigid structure and the sail in the center. You're going to have an automatic counter torque because of the length between those two poles. And then you just go and you hike on the far side, and you're much farther out because torque is R cross F. Your R is much bigger because you're way out there away from the pontoon that's in the water. And thus you make a much bigger counter torque so you can withstand a bigger torque. And you have a lot less boat that's actually in the water with the two pontoons rather than one big key, um, hole. Go ahead. Just curious, why aren't all modern boats multiple holes? I don't know the answer to that. There has been a lot of experimentation with even trying to make things like freighters with multiple holes. So I don't know the answer. I'm sure there's a technical thing that makes it difficult, but I don't know. Anyway, so back to the America's Cup then. The American said there's no way we can make a competitive monster-sized monohole boat, but he didn't specify monohole, so the Americans made a catamaran. And catamarans are so much faster than monoholes that it was a given that they were going to win. The person who had issued the challenge actually tried to sue, saying that that's not within the spirit of the race. But he was the one who was trying to use loophole to steal the race. So... <clears throat> Right, there's a lot of physics that's applicable to the test that's coming up in what I'm saying. Last thing on this, because they had such a fast boat, they were, well, let's use an airplane on it. So they designed an airplane wing that you could just, using a lever, change which side stuck out. So it was like a dual directional airplane wing. And they found that they could sail faster with that than they could with a traditional sail. But the sailors were really uncomfortable with it, and they figured we got so much speed, they sailed the race with just a regular sail. So all of this physics is very significant for boats. And a catamaran can easily go faster than the wind speed. Of course, not if the wind is blowing the same direction you're going. For maximum speed, you want the wind coming at an angle, so yeah, D different wind directions give you different maximum speeds, and different boat styles will give you different maximum speeds for a different angle. And you know, I, I should remember from my sailing class, but you guys weren't even born when I took sailing class, broad reach and beam reach, one of them is fastest for a normal sailboat, one's fastest for a cat. I don't remember which. And you probably don't care, right? How airplanes measure their wind speed is kind of awesome and kind of confusing at the same time. They use this thing called a pitot tube or prandle tube. Is that what? Yeah, prandle or pitot tube. Yeah, I put it in red down there at the bottom. 
And you'll see these things on airplanes, just a little piece that's sticking out, pointing forward. That's to measure the wind speed. And it has a hole for air coming straight at it. And this part actually confuses me. It seems like you'd be jamming the air into that hole and raising the pressure. But because the air has to split and go around that hole, you have the pressure there is just atmospheric pressure. So the pressure in front of the hole, where it's labeled one, it says V1 equals zero, is going to be your atmospheric pressure for whatever your elevation is. <coughs> but then you have the air going over the side, so you see where two is. And you know this, there, these are two models. This one here has the hole inside. It's a cool little problem for glass blowing. This one here has them separate, but the air going by here is going to lower the speed as per Bernoulli's equation. And so you have pressure one minus pressure two is equal to one half the density of the air times speed two squared minus speed one squared but speed one was just zero. So the pressure difference is simply going to be one half the density of air times the speed of the airplane squared. Then there's the measuring part of this. The measuring part of this is just using a manometer where you have pressure differences on two sides of the fluid and you know that the pressure difference from one side to the other side is going to be delta P equals rho GH, where rho is the density of the fluid. And so we can take this equation and say that that pressure difference is equal to rho of the fluid times G times H. So, well, <laughs> those are... We're, we're trying to find the airspeed. Yeah. I was like, those are just two ways of getting the difference in pressure. We're trying to find the airspeed. So to find the airspeed, I would have to take V2 squared is equal to 2 density of the fluid times G times H divided by the density of air. And then, of course, square rooted to get the speed. So it's a pretty cool application, again, of Bernoulli's principle. Now our first kind of problem for you. Here is, I don't know why I stuck with the textbook's picture of this dam in Bulgaria. It's, I don't even see the water flowing out. And you know, we got cool dams in the United States. We don't have to go to Bulgaria to see cool dams. So you have a dam here and this is showing the situation where you are just letting water run out from the bottom of the dam. Normally, you have something like a hydroelectric plant going down. That's a big reason to make dams. So you can convert the potential energy in the water into electrical energy. You have a lake that has a certain height. You take water from down below. You have a pressure difference of rho GH, right? And then you have a blade. And on one side, you have, in theory, atmospheric pressure. On the other side, you have atmospheric pressure plus that rho GH. That's going to make a net force that turns it, that pushes it. And so that force, the net force difference, because of the difference in gravitational potential energy, is converted into rotating a wheel. And that rotating wheel is tied to a, well, it's directly affixed to a dynamo that creates electricity from the rotation. So that's what we usually use the dams for, to convert energy from gravitational potential energy into electrical energy. But for here, we're going to say we just have a hole through the bottom of the dam. If you have a hole through the bottom of the dam, you have the pressure right here. Pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure plus the density of the water times G times H. What's the pressure outside of the dam going to be? Atmosphere. So here we have pressure atmosphere. So now the question is, how fast does the water come out of this hole? 
we have a difference in pressure, but they're same elevation. We have learned that Bernoulli's equation will allow us to calculate this. Bernoulli's equation says pressure one plus one half rho v1 squared plus rho g h1 equals pressure two. That's pressure. So there's Bernoulli's equation again. In this case, again, just like in my previous example, the heights are the same, so I can subtract those out. And I have, what, what's the speed of the water behind the dam? Approximately, approximately zero. And so we're going to have V1 is zero. And so I end up with one half rho V2 squared is equal to pressure one minus pressure two is equal to rho water GH because pressure two is pressure atmosphere. Pressure one was pressure atmosphere plus rho GH. And so quickly solving that for speed, you have speed squared is equal to, well, notice this was water as well. So the densities of water are going to cancel in this calculation. Um, I, am, <clears throat> I am confusing myself. Okay, yeah, that's correct. So the speed it comes out squared is 2gh. So the speed it comes out with is going to be square root of 2gh. Notice this is scalar. It doesn't matter if you're shooting up or shooting down or shooting sideways. But something interesting to note, if you're shooting it up, this is exactly the speed you would have had if the water had started from rest at the top of the dam and just falls, falling straight down. So if you shoot it up, you're reversing that the water should shoot back up to the height of the dam. That should be the highest elevation it reaches. Because we're conserving energy. So that's an interesting thing to note. If, if this had a, if it has something that made it so it shot up and there was no air resistance and no friction of any kind, the water would go up to the height of the dam and then fall back down. So a question that, that I know James answered for us, just to make sure everybody was with James, you don't have to answer again. What is the pressure of the water when it exits the hole in the dam? It's which one? Okay, it's not A because you had the pressure inside, you had a lower pressure outside and accelerated it, right? You had a net force because of the difference in pressure. If it was the same pressure inside, it would not have been pushed out. Okay, what atmosphere is the correct answer? Because it's open to the atmosphere, the pressure on the outside is going to be one atmosphere. Now, this is kind of glossing things over because at what location is outside exactly it's not right at the edge of the hole it's going to be probably a little bit further out than that but we're just saying okay it's air pressure outside on the outside parts of the stream it's one atmosphere and we can go with that so notice it's one atmosphere the same as the air outside the dam it's not a vacuum zero pressure is what a vacuum is Remember, pressure is always pushing into a surface. So I can push in the surface really hard or softer, softer, but you can never 
have a pushing into the surface that's going away from the surface. That would be kind of a definition problem. So the lowest pressure can reach is zero. We call that vacuum, and then you just no longer have contact between the surfaces. Okay, a practical problem. So, uh, no, I'm not going to have you do this one. I'm going to – no, I will have you do this one. So join up with your teams. We're not going to finish the class on this, but we're going to do the problem now. So just as one more reminder, the teams are Wes, Trace, Nate, Michael, Emily, Max, Andrew, Sarah Ha, Kaylin, Mira, Ryan, Lydia, Madison, Sarah, Clayton, and DJs Leslie and James. Remember, raise your hand if you take the group out of We'll get to reality in the next slide. Thank you. 
this answer first that they didn't ask me about. They asked me about a second answer that was incorrect, so I told them, well, you have it here. Okay, here's your stylus. Um, so, pressure equals height, um, density, gravity, plus the, init the initial pressure at the top of the gauge pressure. So you just plug it in. So you have the height of 10 meters and then just the 3.5 times 10 to the fifth. And then you have gravity 9.8 meters per second squared. And then plus, sorry. Um, should be the oh, the density. Yeah. This should be. Yeah, that's the thing because plus. Yeah. Zero. Um, one times ten to the third. Kilogram. Meters cubed. Plus um three point five times. 
10 to the fifth, which equals oh, 4, 8, Alright, so in the end they ripped it out quickly, it just took a while to get there. Now, Wes said, now this isn't realistic, it's not for a number of reasons. Reason number one, we usually flow water, and if the water's flowing, then we're going to have the velocities that makes a difference, and so the nozzle size is going to make a big difference. And you also have resistance in the uh, hoses. So like in Fire Academy, they just taught us, and it's been a long time since I went to Fire Academy, they just taught us this much PSI per 100 feet of hose is how much you're going to have drop in the hose. And so for, for being an, an engine operator, you have to be able to calculate, okay, there this much in change in elevation, and it's this much hose, I need to give them this much pressure for them to have that pressure when they're not flowing water, so they'll have this pressure when they're flowing water. Now, these calculations can lead to truck operators making mistakes because they just learned an equation, didn't think about it. An example we had at PUC, there's a, there, there was a fire just on the other side of a road and you had to go down a creek bed and then up the other side. And it was quite a ways up the hill. And so the operators are jacking the um, pressure up so that there'll be enough pressure at the nozzle. And they've made sure that the pressure they have is below the burst pressure of their hoses, because that's kind of important. And yet all the hoses started bursting. Where would the hoses be bursting from the description I gave you? You have here's the truck goes down a ravine and then up the side of a hill, where the, the hose is going to be bursting? The bottom. Why are the hoses bursting at the bottom? Yeah, because you go down, and so the pressure increases as you go down. And so they had a pressure that was safe for the hoses here, but by the time they got down here, too much, and you have bursting. And so they had a problem because they really couldn't put the fire out because it was going to require more pressure than the hoses could withstand there. So let's talk about flow of fluids in a more realistic way. First, we need to know the difference between laminar flow and turbulent flow. Laminar means in layers. Laminar flow is a smooth flow. So if I turn on this water slowly, there's a nice laminar flow of water. It's nice and smooth. If I turn it on high, now we have a turbulent flow. It's got air that's mixed in. The water is going at different speeds. As you can tell, the difference between laminar and fluid flow has something to do with how fast the water is flowing. And so in the end of the lecture, we have the term Reynolds numbers and all these calculations for Reynolds numbers. Reynolds numbers is the way scientists calculate if it's likely to be turbulent or laminar. But I want to start with why would you have turbulent versus laminar flow to begin with? Laminar flow, it's all moving nice and smoothly together. Turbulent flow, it's not. So in a normal situation, this is water going in the stream. You have a certain, let's call it friction, between the water and the stream bed. So the water that's right in the sand is not moving. The water right above is going to be moving with respect to that a little bit. And then the speed is going to get faster and faster as you get farther away from the sand. So that's what's being illustrated in this left picture. The speed of the flow is increasing as you get farther away from the sand. So you have a profile in speeds. It's not the same speed everywhere. As the water speeds up, you get the difference in speeds of these layers is so big that the force that's holding the water molecules together doesn't keep them together. And you have what we call cavitation. You create cavities or gaps where it's vacuum. And that's what brings on turbulent flow. Or if you have an obstruction, that can also bring on turbulent flow. So obstructions or high difference in water speeds will bring on turbulent flow. 
What's his lambda mean? Which one of those is correct? It can be tricky if you don't remember what the definition is. A, laminar flow means layers. Uniform flow would be all of the water has the same speed. That's not what laminar flow means. That would be super laminar flow. <laughs> super laminar is when it all has the same speed. If you're making a fountain, you would like to have super laminar flow because then the water traveling through the air all has the same speed, so it follows the same path. Whereas if sun's going faster, it's going to shoot farther than the stuff that's going slower. It's going to separate. So for fountains, you want super laminar flow. Um, the other ones are kind of silly. Jing. I'm just curious about the faucet. Um, if it's flowing at a pressure, if it has a pressure, then it's just flowing at the speed of, or just a like gravity. Um, would, is that what would make it smooth? But if it's slightly faster, that's what causes. Um, I'll, I'll actually talk about it a little bit coming up here. Oh, I only have four minutes. Hopefully, I'll talk about it a little coming up. I, I do have a plan to talk about that and to answer your question. One of the important things for talking about this flow is viscosity. And I don't know if they still have these commercials on TV because, frankly, I don't watch commercials anymore. Um, but they used to have commercials about your motor oil and viscosity breakdown. Viscosity is a measurement of how easily or hard a fluid flows. If the fluid is really strongly bound one molecule to the next, it's not going to flow very well. So an example of a very slow flowing fluid would be something like molasses, which means it has a very high viscosity. High viscosity means it doesn't flow very well. Low viscosity flows very, very freely. So water is a generally low viscosity fluid. Not the lowest, like I believe alcohol is a lower viscosity. But that's what viscosity is. And it has a, a specific definition here. Viscosity, that's the Greek letter eta, or H if you will, is equal to the force you apply to the plate on top that's moving times the separation between that plate and a stationary plate divided by the speed difference between the moving plate and the stationary plate times the area of the plate. What they do in practice is they basically make two cylinders and they spin one cylinder and they measure the resistance to the, the spin and that tells them what the force is and the length is the gap between the cylinders. The area would be the area, surface area of the cylinder. And so that's how they practically measure it. Now I can talk about it a little bit. If you have a non-viscous material, something with zero viscosity, it's just going to have constant speed everywhere because it has no restriction to flow. If you have something that's very viscous, you're going to have very different flow rates. If you watch a lava flow, it goes really slow, and you see you know, the bottom here and the top is moving over it. You know, something like this that you can see in the lava flow. To make a... A fountain, you want to have super laminar flow. You want to have all of the water the same speed. And the way they do it is also what we use in fire hoses. How many people have experience with the nozzles on fire hoses? No one? Okay, well, in the nozzles, we have these things that basically look like potato mashers. And the point of those is to make the water essentially go through a whole bunch of small tubes. In this case, they're just square tubes. It's not like we're going to high science here. But it's going through a whole bunch of tubes, so each of those tubes will have a distribution of speeds, something like that. But then when the water comes back together, you have the same distribution repeated, you know, 50 times. And so the average speed is just about the same. And so it it makes it so it smooths out the speed so it's just about the same everywhere so that you can make a nice uniform um, not beam, nice uniform stream of water coming out of the nozzle if that's your desire. Then we also have things to break it up and to make it a mist so you can get different types. So for a fountain, they will do things like take a whole bunch of those little tiny coffee straws and pack them together then you force the water through those, and it comes out, and each straw has 
a profile for the speeds like this because they have the same profile, it comes together and it's pretty much a uniform flow or super laminar. That was your question, right? No? <laughs> okay, the last thing, and we're not gonna work any problems with Poiseuille's law. You're also not gonna have Poiseuille's law on the test, but this is the real truth of things like with fire hoses, the flow rate Q, so Q is, the flow rate the volume flowing per unit time is equal to the pressure difference divided by this r value where r is this here that r is not the reynolds number it's a resistance to flow and notice that resistance to flow is proportional to pi times radius to the fourth power so as you change the radius of your hose, you're going to have a different pressure loss per unit length. And you can calculate use that using the viscosity of your fluid, the length of hose, and the radius of the hose. And I usually have students calculate actually what went on with my dad. My dad had 90% occlusion in his coronary arteries and, you know, can calculate stuff here. But we're out of time. Have a happy Sabbath, Andrew. Um, for the homework is that also postponed um no the homework was actually timed so it didn't have any of this stuff on it okay. but yes thank you for bringing that up the reading quiz that it says was due today i intended to move that off but i could not because once students start it it doesn't give me the ability to make that change so i will grade it as due on um wednesday DJ. Uh, and just to like refresh, the scope of the material on the test is everything that we've done so far. Through today, right. Like we haven't gone over the tape like we did last time. Well, no, the last time we were like 10 was today was going to be new material. Okay. But we didn't have the new material today. It was finishing up. Okay. So, so yeah, that's the way it's supposed to be. This is the end point. Okay. Yes. There, no, there's nothing more that we have to test than what we now. Okay. Okay, so um, is there homework to tonight? Um, yeah.